Hello. I've not come here to talk about cows, I'll even show you cows. As a Scottish historian and tour guide, this is what the other guide, Samantha, would say was, are you really going to take them and show them stuff that isn't there anymore? Yeah. That town over there is Kelso in the Scottish borders. And I've come to uh, a place called Roxburgh, Old Roxburgh, the city that is no more. This is the edge of a city that disappeared in the 1600s and was there from about the 1100s. And I'm just going to give you a bit of geography. You'll see a line of trees running down there. That's the River Teviot coming in. And then in front of the town of Kelso, at the foot of the sort of slope of the hill of the houses, that's the River Tweed. And they join kind of where that fishing shed is over there. So this is a point of land, and somewhere, kind of where the sheep are, in the middle distance, running across, is a ditch that's not visible anymore. Even professional archaeologists would have trouble finding it uh, by what's on the ground. But there used to be a, a boundary that cut off that land there. That land is probably was probably floodplain, where they grew crops, and coming this way is the city. So all of this here, where the cows are, running up this slope here, there were houses and streets. In fact, if I've got my orientation correctly, on the top of this sort of flat slope, just beyond these trees here, that's where there was a hospital. More in a minute. I've moved up onto the hill, I think, where the hospital used to be. I can just see in the field down there, very faint, a line. That might be where the town ditch was. This field below us is called Friars Hoch, and Hoch is a Scots word, not English, not Gaelic, but Scots, and it means something like a water meadow, and down where the fishing hut is there, the join of the two rivers, so you can see this a river to the coming in that side and a river coming in that side, so that would be a water meadow. Who the friars were, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, over here, there's a wee white cottage just in there, it's called Friars Cottage, so it probably was a medieval friary where uh, they owned a lot of the land around here, probably just outside the city, as was Old Roxburgh, and this is kind of where it was, up this area. And then in the distance you can see the green trees there. That is a ridge, and we'll get to that in a bit. That is Fleur's Castle. That is the seat of the Duke of Roxburgh. And you might say that's, that's the, the version 2, because you can maybe just make out the river that divides us. That's the Tweed there. And I'm heading up towards this ridge of trees where the original castle seat was, and there's very little left of it. So this is the lost city of Roxburgh, and I'll maybe uncover a little bit about why there's nothing here today. Um, it's worth considering that this city was one of the five principal cities in Scotland in the late medieval period, let's say 1400 to 1500, that kind of period. It was one of the five great cities, and now it's no more. It's gone entirely. And what you should be looking at is something like the streets of Edinburgh here. There's quite a lot of mystery about why this place disappeared and where the various buildings were. This is us looking across the Tweed to Fleur's Castle here, and I think if I've got my orientation correctly, just in the ground here between sort of the flat land and, and, and the river as it heads out, I think that's where there was quite a substantial kirk, a church called St James Church and a cemetery. I've come away from the, the river that's just over here, so I've come in land from James Kirk, which is, the church is just was that way. And this is the bit that's the only extant part of Old Roxburgh. This is Roxburgh Castle and there's a ridge that runs like this along here. The road is now at the foot of the ridge and this is a natural bit of land ridge and on top of this 
is the castle, and it was quite a long castle by all accounts, and then more of the city is on the slope of that side, so I'm going to go over and have a look at that, or not. I don't know if you can see that at the foot of the slope just here, running along, that's a, a man-dug ditch. So that bit of land there is lower and it rises up to the modern road. That's quite deliberate, that would have probably been dug as a defensive ditch. Oftentimes in archaeology, the only stuff that can survive is earthworks. So you see these great mounds of earth or great cuts where thousands of hours, hundreds of people, probably slaves and prisoners of war, would dig the ground to make these enclosures uh, for drainage purposes, but most often in this case, like in this case, for defensive purposes. And this is that castle tower or wall closer up. This here is a door jam. There's been a door that's probably closed across to hit that. And then that in there looks a curve might be a bread oven. It's possible that might be a bread oven. This may, it might be in the kitchen or bakery or even brew house. Just to give a, another orientation of where we are. So there's a crust of floors. Okay, there's the bit of wall we just looked at. Here's another bit. And that's the river down there. So you can see how close the castle is and it almost looks like a cliff face into the river. If I turn around and look back towards floors again, and remember there's not much distance between the ditch over there and the river. So this piece of land comes along. It's quite a narrow strip. I think it's been a curious. Obviously the castle's built on the ridge, but the city is on a very narrow strip of land between these two rivers. I've just come in there, and you see this wall here has a round, quite a wide circle curve, and also curves up that way. I think this is probably the base, this is the basement of a large round tower that probably the curtain, the rest of the base would have come around and it would have gone up this way. Quite a big castle at this point. If you go to Egypt, you find cities buried under sand. That's how the reclaiming happens there. Right now, I'm in a castle courtyard. In Scotland, it's reclaimed by nettles and trees. That, I think, is the perimeter wall. If you go over that, you fall down a cliff. And I'm just noticing this kind of flat-topped hill. That looks like a very small mot. There was probably a, a building on that. Uh, so it's, it's isolated and defended within inside the castle courtyard. That's us looking down onto the Teviot, the River Teviot. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? And as the land begins to widen out a little bit over here, I think that's where a lot of the city was. So the castle's on one end of the ridge and it kind of widens out and the city's over there and then the Friars Hoch is over there. It's kind of like a, a modern extension. <laughs> when I say modern, probably in the 1400s the city was extended that way. Probably through the fact that there was a friary there and that's the land they got. So the river Teviot's down there, running that way. You might just see it through there. It might be difficult if you're not used to this sort of thing to envisage this as a castle. I'm standing in a courtyard. So one curtain wall ran along here and that's a drop off on the other side. And then it looks like the wall ran along here, probably a tower there. Maybe a guard tower here. Almost certainly the door to the castle, the main gate, was maybe about here. Possibly up there. Yeah, and then the other curtain wall that isolates it from the river runs along here. So it's quite a, a long, thin castle, but if I turn around, you need a lot of imagination to imagine workshops, lean-to wooden buildings. And this is the Mott, I think, so there would have probably been a castle tower, a central tower here, I'm guessing. There you go. This is where I think the castle gateway might have been. There might have been a, an archway there. I'm just thinking about how things typically work. And the passageway comes up, maybe kind of like this. And this is a rather curiously large window, quite low down. It's, it's up on the, the ground floor. I think maybe the window is bigger than it, it used to be. It's sort of fallen out, but it's 
impossible that's a, a dwelling, a domestic area because it's south facing the sun, that's over to the south, so this would be a nice view over the river, not that castles were built for their view by any means, so it's a rather curiously large window considering where it is close to the gatehouse I don't think it's a door, I think that would be a strange place, it's not big enough to be the castle gate either I think it might be confirmed by what's the here, this is the gate, can you see the wall rises up and then curves? So I think there's probably an arch that came all the way over here. And then this big mound of grass covers a substantial wall that would have run in that direction. So this is probably the medieval entrance. So you're looking at a castle that was probably begun in around about 1200-ish, 1100-ish. But there would have been maybe a, a, another kind of defensive thing here and a, a sort of a town, a village, probably a thousand years ago. down to the TV and uh, I think I found probably a second gate. This might be the outer gate to the castle here. There's a mound just here. That's probably the base of one tower or doorpost so to speak. And can you see there's a slot in the wall there. That could be where a portcullis goes or possibly uh, a hinge of a door. So above here would be a huge arch. So it looks like there's the first gate I showed you would be an inner defence and this is a substantial gate tower. And we're looking all the way up. The other gate is just there, would have been here. And then some form of castle structure exists up there. I mentioned earthworks earlier. You can probably see this quite clearly. There's a, a ridge just r running right up there. That's a ditch on this side of it. You see kind of where this whitish tree is. A huge ditch about 20 foot deep and the earth has been mounded up. That could be much older than the castle. And if you can see just before the tree there, there's another ridge just there. So it's a double ditch which separates, it connects that river defensively to the river that's over there and cuts off everywhere I'm standing from being attacked from over there. quite easy at this point to see the ditch. That's the berm and the berm. And you can see the curve there of the ditch. So this ditch is only about 10 feet deep. This is the outer one and the castle's to the right. Now forgive me, I'm doing this a little bit from memory. The castle's directly behind me and you can see some trees just in the middle distance there. If I remember rightly, that's the end of the city. So it doesn't really go any further beyond that. So this barley field here from the river on the left, up the slope and over the ridge there and down to the other river, this barley field had major thoroughfares and a crossroads. And when they did some investigation, they found where uh, workshops and houses had been. So if you want to picture what it'd be like, uh, a fairly wide street from medieval times, probably 30 feet wide, drainage ditch running along the edge of it to get all the slops away, timber frame houses like the Tudor houses, probably two storeys, a major crossroads was somewhere over a few hundred yards over there, so there's a street that runs up, which I think I remember right, it was called King's Road or King Street, and then a market street ran this way. And uh, when Time Team, Channel 4's Time Team, the archaeological investigation show came along here about mm, 15 years ago, they found a lot of these streets and the sort of footprint of them. And I remember that Carenza Lewis, she spent some time in the archives and she actually worked out who lived on the corner of the crossroads that's in the middle there. So uh, they actually got names of tenants. So it's bizarre to look at it now and think it's just a barley field. But under there, believe it or not, there is a small city. One of the other archaeologists, field archaeologist Matt Williams, took himself up to this top of this ridge area here. And you see where these tire tracks are from the tractor? Coincidentally, they lie, I think, where he discovered an unknown road. It was a, a lesser, a minor road, so it wasn't the main thoroughfare of the city. But they think it ran where these tire tracks are, roughly speaking. And that's probably where the posh houses were, the merchants' houses. But turning round, you can clearly see the ditch down here, and that's the edge of the castle wall. The castle wall ran, ran across the top of here, and then you see that slope. That's a very defensive corner, effectively. The corner runs around there. That's the corner of the castle. I've come across the road that 
runs along the foot of the castle slope here, and that's us looking over to Fleur's, Fleur's Castle, the modern version as it were. And this bit of land here was here during the medieval period, you know, 1300s, 1400s, and a bit of the town was over here, and it's possible that that's where St James Church was, somewhere about there. Where I said it was earlier was maybe along there, and I can't quite remember where they discovered parts of it. Somewhere in that maybe quarter mile stretch, there's the defensive ditch. Imagine being an attacker, having to climb up this fairly substantial slope, and then there'd be a castle wall about half the height of that tree above you. So your defenders are throwing sticks and stones and whatever down at you from about 60 feet in height there. It's not entirely clear, but Kelso is quite close to the English-Scottish border. And so, as anyone who knows the borders knows, the people of the borders, the borderers, are not Scottish and they're not English because they don't give a damn about either side because over history they were plundered by both sides. So any time Scotland and England had a disagreement, the border towns got hammered. Um, and so what happened here, the castle, was in English hands at least twice and one time for about nearly a hundred years and in between that it was in Scottish hands. I think James II took it back after a siege and so on. And then, I think it was 1540 if I remember rightly the date, James II ordered the castle to be dismantled after he'd taken it. And so when the castle fell, and that would mean that the, the town itself, the city was not so defendable. I think it was just a difficult time and it wasn't defended and the locals just slowly began to abandon it or even quite quickly. So by the 1600s, maybe 80, maybe 100 years later, there was nothing here to see. So we think that's why there is not a city here. I'm back down by the Friars Hoch looking over to Kelso. I'm walking along a path and I've come across this information board. It's quite old, a bit overgrown. Uh, I thought I'd show it to you and read this. I'll give you the I'll show you the, the, the drawing that they've done. That's what a, a town in this time would have looked like. I'll read this out to you. It says, From busy town to green fields, one of the most important towns in medieval Scotland once stood on the Hochland, the riverside fields, across the road. Tucked between the rivers Tweed and Teviot, the town of Roxburgh was also protected by a mighty castle. David, the first king of Scotland from 1124 to 1153 sometimes ruled the country from Roxburgh and gave it the status of royal borough. This made it a privileged town with the right to trade with foreign countries. Roxburgh soon grew into an international centre dealing with raw wool from the vast sheep flocks managed by the Abbey of Kelso, Jedburgh, Dryburgh and Melrose. Merchants from France, Italy and the Netherlands and the Baltic came to trade. The town was so successful the walls had to be expanded in 1150 to make room for the growing population. By this time Roxburgh boasted four churches, a grammar school and five mint masters who had the right to make coins. But Roxburgh suffered badly in the wars between Scotland and England in the 14th and 15th centuries. Trade became difficult and merchants began to send wool to Edinburgh instead, shipping it to the continent through Leith when the English captured Berwick-upon-Tweed in 1482, blocking trade through Roxburgh's nearest port. Its fate was sealed. Roxburgh may have gone, but it's left its traces in the grassy hummocks of the fields. Field names, too, are a memorial to David's capital. Friars Hoch, named after the Franciscan monks who had their friary here, and Vigorous Hoch, named after Thomas de Vigurus, a well-known Burgess. So there you go. 